very much. So welcome everybody to uh, what is a fairly descriptively titled talk, ICO regulation in Hong Kong. It's fair to say this is a pretty hot topic at the moment and um, it's not often that lawyers get to give a title like this to a potentially a packed house. Um, usually we have to think of something a bit more interesting like, you know, sex lies and ICOs or something like that. But anyway, this does the job. So uh, why is this so important right now? Well, everyone's talking about ICOs, everyone's talking about uh, what the regulatory regime is here and around the world and where it's going and that's what we're going to try and pick apart today. So um, just to give you a bit of information about us, we're uh, lawyers from RPC which is a British law firm we have offices here in Hong Kong, Singapore and London. Uh, our, Mark and I, our particular area of practice is <coughs> cryptocurrency and fintech and also cyber security. And in the last couple of years, increasingly, we've been advising on Bitcoin-related matters, both on the kind of contentious side and the non-contentious side. So there's really a lot going on in this field at the moment, which is uh, very exciting for us. Um, I have to say this, so I don't get sued. Um, we're not giving legal advice. This is just a talk to talk around the issues, give you some of our thoughts and insights from our own perspective as legal practitioners. But we can't be seen to be giving legal advice to you. We're not um, in a client relationship with you. So just to mark that there for the time being. So um, this is an outline of what we're going to cover today. In basic terms, we really need to make sure that everyone here kind of um, is on a level. Uh, I don't know what sort of level of uh, knowledge some of you might have. Some is more than others. So we're going to just start off with a basic description of how a token sale or ICO works, what it actually is, and then compare that with other forms of crowdfunding and raising capital, and then look at the regulatory trends around the world and the situation in Hong Kong where it's all leading. Um, so um, without further ado, I'll pass over to my colleague Mark and he can start you off on, on that first section. Okay. Right, um, okay, let's just start here. Um, so what exactly is an ICO? How, how does it work? Um, for starters, uh, simply put, an ICO is a form of crowdfunding, uh, which involves the uh, creation and the issuance of a digital token. Now, uh, this structure, as you can see there, is relatively simple. Now, of course, um, every ICO is different, but this is something, this is a typical structure which, which we would normally see um, for an ICO. Um, in order to start, all you really need is a good idea for a blockchain project. Um, once the team has been assembled uh, for that project, you can pretty much already move on to the white paper slash marketing stage. Um, the white paper, which is the, uh, one of the key documents which uh, Ben and I would look at in our day-to-day -day work, uh, is a document which generally describes things such as uh, the vision of the project, uh, the team involved, um, how the project uh, would be commercialized um, and the like. And of course, uh, the white paper you know, may also contain um, how the token sale would work um, in terms of the price um, and how many uh, digital tokens uh, will be distributed. Um, from a legal perspective, uh, it's actually quite difficult uh, it's for Ben and I to uh, scrutinize and um, pick apart uh, white papers because there is simply no standard form. Like on one end of the spectrum, uh, we've got these uh, white papers which are really heavy um, on the technical aspect of, of the project. Um, on, the other, on, the other, on the other end, uh, we've got uh, white papers which are somewhat similar to a prospectus. And of course, we've got everything else in between. Now, uh, once the white paper um, is done, uh, this takes us to the um, actual token sale. Um, investors would generally uh, invest by uh, transferring um, fiat currencies um, on rare occasions and more, more frequently uh, cryptocurrencies um, to the issuers in exchange for tokens. Um, this subscription process uh, can be over very, very quickly. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, the ICO for the uh, BAT token was over in 30 seconds last year and a total of uh, $35 million was raised. Um, I think the ability for issuers to accept um, cryptocurrency as payment, as, um, as, in, as investment, uh, is, very, is one of the uh, appealing features of an ICO. 
Uh, the reason for this is that it allows um, the issuers to keep the investment within the uh, crypto economy. Now, once the uh, subscription process is over, uh, the tokens will then be distributed to the buyers, and the management team will be left to um, oversee the project. Right, moving on. Uh, let's take a look at how ICOs compare with other forms of uh, fundraising. Um, in the media, um, ICOs are quite often compared with, to IPOs. After all, the term ICO you know, is derived from IPO. Um, in terms of high-level concept, um, ICOs and IPOs are quite similar in the sense that um, they're, both, uh, they're both forms of uh, fundraising uh, and appeals to investors, appeals to investors in the sense, um, in terms of uh, investment potential. Well, this is probably uh, where the similarity ends. So, you know, the, uh, the similarity um, in the name between ICO and IPO is actually a bit misleading because the underlying nature is quite different. IPO investors, they put money into, a, into companies which are normally very well established with a very good track record. But with ICOs, the investments quite often are simply startup companies with a good, good project. So any calls for ICOs to follow the regulations of an IPO is simply unrealistic and it's not going to work. Now looking at the um, IPO regulatory framework, um, besides the heavy uh, regulatory authority involvement, um, IPO companies are also required to um, follow strict procedural requirements. Over things such as uh, the pricing, uh, due diligence, um, allocation and the like. Um, IPO companies are also required to um, meet high thresholds um, in terms of um, the track record and the, the earning and, and the previous earning. IPOs um, also demand a high level of transparency. Um, as you know, IPOs uh, requires publication of a prospectus. Now, this is a legal document which details almost everything that an investor would need to make a fully informed decision. With ICOs, there is no such legal requirement to publish a legal document. So you can imagine how difficult it would be for an investor to, to, do, to properly do their due diligence. So to sum up, while IPOs and ICOs may appear similar at the service level, they're actually quite different. So, you know, but then again, treating ICOs, you know, it, it is a, a, a product of its own, you know, we can't really use IPO regulatory framework to uh, just to, uh, just adopt it. Sorry, how we go? Um, but um, with with IPOs and ICOs, they're completely different. There is no way we can simply apply the IPO framework onto an ICO. Um, by way of illustration, this is what um, an IPO. This is a roadmap for an IPO, just to show. Uh, the number of entities which are involved. We've got sponsors, we've got experts, we've got lawyers, um, accountants, we've got a stock exchange, uh, we've got SFC involvement. It's a very, very long process. Right, so if ICO is not similar to an IPO, what is it similar to? In a way, ICO is more akin to a crowd fund crowdfunding. It is similar in the sense that it is low cost, it appeals to the public, and it is really popular. Um, ICOs also are focused on uh, raising money for companies which are still in this infant stage. But then, at the same time, an ICO uh, doesn't shy away from an IPO's appeal to investors in terms of uh, investment uh, potential. This is something which um, a crowdfunding typically lacks. So, yeah, just moving on from what um, Mark was referring to there, to illustrating really the nature of the problem that Mark was just doing, which is to say that we have existing regulatory regimes, but they don't really fit with uh, cryptocurrencies and digital tokens very well. And that's partly because there are different kinds of tokens. So this isn't a very, you know, we can't just say this is an ICO and it's one size fits all. You have many different categories of token. This is a, a common uh, way of differentiating between them, the three different main groups of token. Some people would say there are five or ten or two. But this is probably the most helpful. Um, the first type is cryptocurrency, so pure cryptocurrencies, if you like. Um, Bitcoin would be an obvious example of that. So it doesn't have any, arguably has no function other than as a medium of exchange of value or store of value. Uh, it can't 
function as a security or an investment in itself, and um, which I'll, I'll come on to in security tokens. And then utility tokens are a, a different thing entirely. And cryptocurrency wouldn't have any other functions outside of being a pure cryptocurrency. Um, so the, the second type of currency, as I mentioned here, the security token, that is the type which gets everybody excited and everyone's quite worried about falling within because that's the one that um, has been the subject of regulatory scrutiny. And this all began with the, uh, the DAO project in 2017, which um, as some of you may know is a, is a failed project on the Ethereum platform um, involving um, a sort of pseudo-corporate entity built out of smart contracts with a, a, um, a um, profit motive. So essentially they were um, encouraging investors to buy tokens which represented a, uh, an interest in the DAO project um, and the, the idea was that they would reap a reward, they would get a benefit from the functioning of this organisation. Now um, what happened in that particular case was that the SEC in the US looked at the DAO tokens after the failure of the project, which is a, another question, and they decided that the tokens themselves constituted securities and that meant that they were subject to the federal securities laws, which was a, a rather onerous set of provisions. And the reason that they made that decision was that they looked back on a, an old test from 1946, an old um, US uh, case, where a definition of security was actually laid out in simple terms. And this is it on, replicated on the screen here. So you've got an investment of money, an expectation of profits derived from the investment, and the investment is made in a common enterprise. And one particularly important point is that any profit coming from that investment comes from the efforts of a third party. So there's an involvement of a third party who is helping to, to make money for this project. So these are the constituent elements of security according to the SEC. Um, well, according to this case, and then the SEC ruling on the DAO token referred back to this old decision. And this caused a huge concern within the cryptocurrency and ICO community that everybody was going to be subject to securities regulations. This is a, everything is a, is a token, it is a security token. And so there was a, a scramble in people's minds, well, how do we avoid falling within this definition? And one of the obvious ways of trying to do that is to be a utility token. So this is where a token, at least on the face of it, does not have an investment purpose, but rather has a utility. And that utility may be, for example, participation in a, a software uh, project. Um, it may be a token which gives you the ability to, to trade products and services within a particular ecosystem but it doesn't give you um, the constituent elements of the Howey test, so it's not a collective investment in, in that sense, it's not a profit-making enterprise. That doesn't necessarily mean, however, that the tokens themselves can't be traded on another platform, like an exchange, and thereby have a market value through which the tokens will, will actually generate the holders' profits. So the real fight at the moment is between these three categories of tokens, which category do you fall within? Are you a utility? Are you a cryptocurrency? Are you a security? And that's what all of this talk about regulation really boils down to, whether it's the SEC or the SFC in Hong Kong or wherever in the world, it's all about this question. Um, and you can see there are different trends emerging around the world in terms of how this is treated. So everyone I would say pretty much every jurisdiction in the world is waking up now to the need to regulate ICOs in some sense. And there are extremes. You know, on one end, you've got the uh, Chinese uh, approach, the mainland Chinese approach, which is ban ICOs entirely. And then at the other extreme, you have um, very pro um, digital token um, jurisdictions such as Gibraltar and Switzerland. And we'll come on to those. And everyone else is somewhere in the middle. But there's a lot of uncertainty still about how that treatment is operating in the different jurisdictions. A lot of jurisdictions are operating within a kind of a regulatory black hole. Hong Kong is, to a large extent, one of those. 
it's not um, anti-ICO on the face of it, but there isn't a huge amount of clarity coming from the regulators or the government on what direction we're heading in, and which, which is why you know, a talk like this is, is of interest to people. Um, here's a graphic which gives you a basic idea of the sort of trends. So as I mentioned, mainland China at one end of the scale. Uh, South Korea also banned ICOs last year. And uh, just moving to the right, Japan probably should be a bit further to the left now since the coin check hack, the coin check hack happened a few months ago. Um, and you can see that Hong Kong is sort of in the middle at the moment. Um, and then we have Gibraltar and Switzerland who are really trying to push this. And they've got um, a very positive frameworks of regulation being established and, and uh, refined over time. So that's the basic layout, but that's very much subject to change as time goes on. But you know, every, pretty much every week you hear a regulator around the world make an announcement which might trend, tend one way or the other. The US in particular has become more conservative over the last few months. And in Hong Kong specifically, really this all began um, the SFC's involvement in cryptocurrencies and ICOs began in September last year. It seems like a really long time ago now, but it's, it's only a few months. And that was really building upon what the SEC did in the US in uh, July of, the, of 2017. So the SFC is essentially replicating the, the findings from the SEC uh, in the DAO project, which I mentioned previously. Um, and just setting out a few examples of how digital tokens offered in ICO may fall within the existing regulatory framework. So first of all, you have um, the possibility of a, essentially an equity token, uh, essentially akin to shares, if an ICO token represents um, equity and ownership interests. Secondly, you've got debt interests, ventures, <coughs> and thirdly, you have the concept of it collective investment scheme where the, the tokens represent an interest in a collective investment scheme run by a scheme operator with a view to generating profits for all the token holders. So this was the initial kind of shot across the bows that the SFC announced back in September last year. And, uh, and there have been further announcements and noises from the regulators since then about you know, being careful about fraud and money laundering and usual sorts of things. And there have been some specific, in fact now there has been enforcement action taken which we'll, we'll come on to. But this is the direction things started going in back in September. Um, in February this year, we had a further announcement from the SFC which was warning of potential risks in investing in ICOs and um, this followed a number of complaints against ICO issuers and you've got to look again at the context of what's happening around the world. This isn't just happening in isolation in Hong Kong but also similar things are happening for example in the United States three days before this notice came out there was a, a Senate uh, committee meeting with the SEC where um, there were concerns raised about ICOs and very much, Hong Kong is very much following what's happening in the US and you can see facing the timing of that's what's going on. Around the same time we also had um, the restriction on advertising of ICOs which you've probably heard of, Facebook and Twitter and Google saying we're not going to allow this anymore and um, that's just following government pressure really around the world that they're clamping down on this ostensibly with a view to protecting investors, whether there are other um, agendas involved, that's, that's another question. Um, and uh, as I say, the regulatory landscape is, is constantly changing, so we constantly need to look not just at what's happening in Hong Kong, but what's happening elsewhere around the world. And um, you know, whether we'll follow the mainland Chinese example or the you know, Gibraltar example, is, is an open question which we'll, but we'll try and tease out an answer to that question today. Um, Mark, do you want to take up the sure. white cell matter? Sure. This brings us to the, uh, our first case study. Um, well, in March this year, uh, the SFC halted a black cell from issuing um, the ICO in Hong Kong. 
Um, this is actually the first time the um, SFC has publicly named an ICO issuer that it has taken action against. Um, in terms of uh, what actually happened in this case, uh, Black Cell had promoted um, an ICO to sell digital tokens called Crop Coins uh, to its investors. Uh, the website for this ICO was available to, uh, for access in Hong Kong. Um, as part of the ICO, it was, uh, it was intended that uh, contributors of the ICO would be eligible to redeem um, equity shares in the company. Now, it was quite easy to see why the FCFC um, uh, would, would be concerned about um, this uh, ICO. Uh, the fact that you know, um, it gives the uh, investors the capability to redeem equity shares would be the first red flag. Um, in this case, the question which uh, the SFC really had to ask was, is the ICO a collective investment scheme that would require the regulars which would require their approval to sell or market to the general public in Hong Kong? Now for this case, we don't really need to go through the um, elements of the collective investment scheme, even though it's here on, on, on the screen here. This is such a clear-cut case that you know, it really, really, we really don't have to scrutinize uh, what the definition of a collective investment scheme is. Um, in a nutshell, um, the SFC determined that a black sales ICO would be considered a collective investment scheme on the basis of uh, three reasons. Number one, uh, black sales had promoted um, the ICO to the Hong Kong public. Number two, uh, the ICO proceeds would be used to fund the development of a um, mobile app. And number three, holders of the tokens would be eligible to redeem, um, to redeem equity shares in the company. So ultimately, uh, the ICO was stopped in Hong Kong and Black Cell agreed to provide refunds to the investors. Um, Black Cell also undertook uh, not to sell a similar arrangement without seeking the prior approval or, or meeting the, uh, the licensing requirement of the SFC. So what is the implication of this, uh, of this action? Now most importantly, it shows that the SFC is keen to um, take proactive action um, against questionable transactions even without a full investigation or formal sanction. Now, this, also, this ICO also shows the, challenge, the challenges which regulators face due to the global nature of fundraising. This SFC action isn't actually the first action which was taken against Black Cell. Um, earlier this year, I think in January, the, Phil, the, Philipp, uh, the regulators in the Philippines actually issued a cease and desist order against um, Black Cell for this same project. In other words, what we can see here even if an ICO is shut down in a particular jurisdiction, they can simply shift the focus onto another. I'll, I'll now pass this stage right over to Ben to talk about yeah. the um, ICO I will come off. Yeah, so as what I was saying, really the black cell um, enforcement action, although it, it does represent a uh, sign, I suppose, that the SFC will do something, it's not really surprising that they took action in that particular case. It was a fairly clear example of a violation of the securities laws and the SFC statement that was announced in, in September last year. So it doesn't really give us a very strong indication as to which way Hong Kong is, is going to move in the future. Um, but what we have seen over time, and certainly with the bans that have taken place in mainland China and South Korea, is that some business has moved to Hong Kong. Some issuers that were operating in the PLC are now looking at other jurisdictions, including Hong Kong. It's a bit of a mixed bag because some of them will also think that Hong Kong is too closely associated with mainland China, and therefore they might choose another jurisdiction, such as Singapore or, or elsewhere. So looking at where these ICO issuers uh, are going to um, gives you an indication of, of what the kind of legal framework might be, whether it's favourable or not, but it's also a political question. So what are we going to see in future? Well, I think we're going to see ICO regulations pick up pace here in Hong Kong. We'll see more enforcement action from the SFC. We'll see more statements being issued, and a lot of those will follow enforcement action and statements which are taking place and being issued around the world, particularly in the United States. We will see clearer frameworks emerging for the regulation of ICOs, 
both here and elsewhere in the world. And as I said earlier, we're already seeing this delineation into different kinds of um, systems, whether it is um, an outright ban or a very permissive regime. In the context of the outright bans, there are rumors that mainland China and South Korea are already looking at regulation. They're already looking at relaxing that ban at some point in the future. So it seems likely that the move is not going to be towards increased bans, more examples of outright bans, but rather towards greater enforcement and tokens being held to be securities of some kind or another, whether it's under the existing definition of security or whether we're going to see new forms of regulation coming out spearheaded by jurisdictions such as Gibraltar and uh, Switzerland and places like that. So that's the kind of um, picture of things at the moment, very uncertain, very difficult to navigate from a lawyer's perspective because what we say today might be wrong tomorrow or next week. Uh, so we do have to be very careful to keep an eye out on what's happening around the world and, uh, and see where things are moving in Hong Kong. But is this really a bad thing? You know, I think that it's important to bear in mind that regulation can actually be, be beneficial, particularly when you're talking about a new sector such as this. If we don't have any regulation, if there's no legitimacy, if people can be scammed and defrauded with impunity, then that's not going to help the sector in the long run. So what we need is a regulatory environment and a regime which actually allows the growth of this industry, doesn't stifle it, but also maintains a certain amount of protection and legitimacy uh, for, for the investment, investment public. Um, so that's really where we are at the moment. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have questions.